Imagine for a moment that you are a cricket fan, 200 years on from now, and you're reviewing some very important ancient digital footage. It's the 2015 World Cup cricket semi-final between New Zealand and South Africa, and there are two balls to go, and the footage runs out. Technology has not preserved Grant Elliott's winning six. You know about it because the story has become legend and has been passed down through generations of cricket lovers. But frustratingly, in the footage, there's no end of the game. It stops before the game is finished because, you know, technology hasn't preserved it very well. Well, today's Gospel reading from the Gospel of Mark does just that. It stops in the middle of a sentence. The woman went out from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them. They said nothing to anyone. They were afraid for, that's how it reads in the Greek. The sentence and the gospel ends with a preposition, for, and then there's nothing else. The most important story of our Christian faith just stops and the end just hangs out there. And we're left waiting desperately for that six to go over the boundary because we know how it ends. The disciples see the risen Jesus, right? He eats fish with them on the beach. They talk, they touch him. Well, not in Mark's gospel. One scholar, Lamar Williamson says, when is an ending not an end? when a dead man rises from the tomb and when the gospel ends in the middle of a sentence. Now, several ancient versions of the gospel did attempt to fix this anom anomaly by adding other endings. Most Bibles, if you look at them, print three different endings for the gospel of Mark. And the so-called longer ending has an appearance to Mary Magdalene, just like in John's gospel, then a short description of the Emmaus story, just like Luke's gospel, and then a command to go into all the world, like the ending of Matthew's gospel. But the style of writing is so different that you can tell, even in the English, that these were added by another hand, by someone who wanted to make Mark's gospel sound like the others, by someone who wanted an ending. Mark's gospel was the very first one to be written down, and the original writer was obviously happy with his endings. But scribes in the second century added the new ones. Even back then, there was some editor or filmmaker who was saying, we can't have this, we need a conclusion. We need to wrap this up and bring up the background music, roll the credits, and let people leave with a good feeling about this. We can't have they said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. We have to see that six cross the boundary. But on an Easter morning 2,000 plus years on, I think it's hard to relate back to the fear and the uncertainty of that first Easter day. We have centuries of theology and paintings and music and films which kind of sanitize the picture and make it full of those happy images with even those fluffy chicks creeping in. But the version of the gospel that we read today clearly shows us a stark, fresh story. And it's a story which begins in fear and silence. Feminist theologians are always reminding us that in the other versions of the Gospels, it's the women who first spread the good news of Jesus' resurrection. But here, even the women are silenced, or they haven't found their voice yet. And this, in a way, is typical of Mark's Gospel, where the disciples are never heroes. They never understand who Jesus is. Nobody gets it. And earlier on in the gospel, the disciples are specifically told to say, not to say who Jesus is for fear of the Romans and for fear of being misunderstood. Mark's account is very real. Of course the women would have been terrified, 
Most of the disciples have already run off or are hiding, and their teacher and their leader has been brutally killed, and for all they know, they could be next. That Roman rule was very oppressive, and their hopes for any kind of revolution had been dashed. Hiding was definitely a good option. And yet out of love for Jesus, the women went to the tomb to tend to the body as was their custom. It had not been bathed and anointed as was fitting and they needed to complete that task. But to their horror, even this last dignity is taken away from them. The body is gone. There was an angel there, but seeing an angel doesn't really help. It's just one more thing to make you really scared. I said in my sermon on Good Friday that our only response when confronted with the crucifixion of Jesus is silence. We are left wordless in the face of the pain and the forsakenness of it all. But on Easter Day, we come expecting joy and song, not silence. But today we have silence again, even from the women. How often, I wonder, do we find ourselves silent? Silent when we have good news to share, or silent when we have fears to share, silent about the things we really want to do or say, silent about our dreams because we're worried they might seem silly, or silent about our hopes because no one else might share them, or silent about someone we love in case they don't feel the same. Silent about who we really are in case people might criticize. Or are we silenced? Silenced by a bully at work or at school? Silenced by lack of money or lack of skills? Silenced by poverty? Or silenced by illness? Or silenced by an abuse of power? As we look around us at our world this Easter day, we know that there are thousands, if not millions, who are silenced. Refugees in Syria, the kidnapped girls in Nigeria, Palestinians in the Gaza Strip, the slaves of ISIS, political prisoners in so many countries, journalists who cannot write and singers who cannot sing. Some of these voices get a, a, a voice for a day or two on social media, that favorite hashtag that goes viral and then goes quiet again. The lack of an ending that we find in Mark's gospel could also be political. It could also fit into that political context of today. Mark is writing in about the year 70, around the time of the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. Jews are being massacred. Life is full of terror. So they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid is very, very real for Mark's community. And like all political movements know, stuff that is written down can be held against you. A written copy of the gospel with a resurrected Jesus in it was most definitely seditious. Better perhaps not to write it down because the first century version of WikiLeaks is sure to leak it. So we don't know how the women of Mark's gospel found their voice but I'm guessing it was something to do with remembering how much Jesus loved them and he them and they him and thinking about the angel's instructions to go and tell. And perhaps they found their voice remembering many of the confusing things he had taught them about the first being last and losing your life to find it and the poor being blessed. 
and then maybe finding within themselves a seed of hope which said, maybe, maybe he has come back to us. Finding our voice in a world rather too dominated by bad news stories is about finding hope and love and good news stories in those around us because we all have those stories of hope. We all have those sparks of love. Mark's gospel ends abruptly, but I think the editor knew that was where everyone else's story would pick up and continue. And by not giving us the script, the next part of the story is so much more our own, for our own time and our own context. Your story and mine is the next chapter. What we do with the Jesus story is the next chapter of the gospel. So when you find your voice this Easter day, what story will you choose to tell? Grant Elliot hit his six, this we know. The women eventually told what they had seen that first Easter day an empty tomb. The hope that Jesus had brought them in life was real in death also. What hope will you add to the story today? Claim it. Claim life and love and hope. Find your voice. For it is your voice which continues the story.